Welcome to this live stream from windowsontheworld.net. We have a new show every Sunday, 9.30 p.m. That's on the website. And our whole archive is on the website, windowsontheworld.net. And you can find the most fascinating stuff there, including what we're going to be talking about today with author Nick Collistrom, the 7-7 bombings in London. We did a whole series called 7-7 Revisited, and you can find that on an old site called Land of the Free UK, which is a YouTube channel. And I will be uploading the whole thing to Odyssey after this interview. So we're going to carry on and talk about the nature of terrorism, how it's changed and what may be coming next. So Nick, just first of all, can you tell us about your latest book? Because you've done a summation of false flag terror. Okay, Mark, uh, this was um, false flags over Europe. This reviews the terrific grand sequence, uh, a major art form of the 21st century, uh, straight from hell art form, whereby deceptive terror events are created and set up by governments and military working together with the media collaborating. Uh, it's hard to believe it's happening, but why do you really want to believe this is happening in the world you live in? Well, it's a post 9-11 reality that, that we live in. There is a hidden hand that makes these things happen and points at an enemy who you have to hate and fear. Uh, and uh, the, the crucial thing is, uh, as in this Star Wars title, The Phantom Menace, that enemy is drummed up and nearly always in the century it's been Islamic terror that, that uh, as if Muslims are creating these terrible events. Uh, and, yes, uh, I think also, Nick, there's a really strong point here that you just made in that the media are completely complicit with all this, as they were with 7-7, in yeah. respect that the official narrative is never challenged, there's never any information about the culprits, everything gets covered up, and yeah. there's one official narrative and everything outside that gets demonised. Nothing's changed, but it's actually yeah. got worse. The media and, and, has and, actually and, got worse, I believe, since 7-7. Since yeah. Got worse, yeah. And, and all, yeah. The, all the papers say exactly the same thing. Uh, um, there's no different opinions uh, that you get in different newspapers. You, 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 they just print what they're told, um, uh, how, however absurd it is. And uh, for any truthful discussion, you have to go onto the web. So it's a very um, a, a kind of polarity in this century that the newspapers are basically not worth reading. Which is yes. If we go back to the seven seven, it was assumed by the trial judge that the culprits that were brought before the court as accomplices were all guilty. Yeah. And this is something that I've been talking about for years. It goes into this new system of communitarian law. If you are deemed to be outside the official narrative of what's going on or don't support it, then you can be dealt with in a different way. Yeah, and Mark, I think to... that's actually got worse. Yeah, you're referring to the Kingston trial of the friends of the. Yes. Seven, seven exactly. Uh, yes. and, and they had the misfortune to be good friends of these guys. Uh, and yes. uh, they kept, it went on for months, these, these trials. Yes. Uh, and the jury, there was a jury, did not find them guilty. Uh, and so they, they had to the whole thing over again. Eventually, I think they managed to put them in jail. But the, 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 the four alleged terrorists of some were all bumped off. They're all gone. Yes. Uh, uh, but but they wanted some people put in jail. So, so these these uh, acquaintances were somehow uh, a, a, a stories of guilt were woven around them. Really yes, this think. idea of guilt by association, I was trying to get into that because it's extremely important with what's going on now because we find this demonization of people as far right and extremists and anti-vaxxers and all the rest of it. But the rhetoric right. may change slightly, but the intention and the defamation behind it never changes. It's all a way of gaslighting the public and yeah. demonizing and a, uh, an assumed yeah. enemy and it's and, to do with living in a war making society yes and we call upon everyone watching this to say no in your personal way one or another choose how you're going to say no to whatever the war is or whoever the enemy is we don't need an enemy we don't need the war uh, and uh the, the most effective way to deconstruct the rhetoric coming from the government is to try and find out what really happened Indeed, um, indeed. And the the whole thing is that the nature of terrorism changed radically since 9-11. Um, so 9-11 was a spectacular, world-changing event. Right. Then we had more localised terrorism, and yeah. it ended up around 2017, as we were talking about just before the show, with yeah. basically bad driving and terrorism done by people in white vans. 
And we had some ob ob really absurd ones. And that was the last kind of focus on the terrorism narrative, which was yeah, Mark, you know, I think five years ago. The Westminster Bridge thing, where you had some yes. uh, allegedly careered onto the pavement. I mean, it didn't happen, but th that's the story. And he bumped yes, into various yes. people who got thrown over the bridge and so on. And finally rams into the House of Parliament railings. And, and, and then he rushes in there, goes past all the police and bumps off a uh, policeman. Uh, and uh, it was a, a very dramatic, uh, very dramatic event with 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 various um, theatrical groups of dummies and actors gathered at various places along the bridge. As far as I can tell, nobody died, uh, and it was all a set up event. And that was part of the grand culmination, uh, mm. as Mark said, of the the whole this twenty first century fabricated terror art form uh, in which Muslims are demonised. Yeah. Yes, there were several more as well, Nick. I think there was one in Finsbury Park. And they were involving the use of white vans. So white van man became the target, literally, oh, right. as yeah. uh, an aid and abetting to terrorism. And that's when we saw terrorism take this kind of downward turn into bad driving. And it happened, of course, on yeah. the continent as well in France, I think, and, and Belgium. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, uh, OK, well, that was uh after after 2012 when you had you didn't have to have real deaths anymore before then uh, with the terrible events of madrid 2004 and london bombing 2005 there really were gruesome deaths there really was terror and blood um uh, and uh that was necessary to bring the new al-qaeda terror threat over into europe okay it had been created in 9-11 and and uh europeans had to feel the fear uh, and uh, re real deaths were necessary to do that. Um, uh, but after that, they found it was much cheaper and easier to have actors and dummies uh, with drummer Rigby and so on. Um, well, I think also there's a mixture in these events as well, Nick, of the real and the false, because they has to, there has to be control of these events, obviously. And yeah. the, yes, the Lee Rigby thing was an exercise in just spot the in incongruities and the anomalies yeah. Yeah. and there was some ridiculous stuff in that i was at someone's flat at the time and she didn't know anything about this stuff and i said this is a setup it's all been set up and she said oh god you're right and you can tell the the moment that the media gets hold of it the story is created through the media yeah well you see so it's media Rigby. driven yeah mm. the the body on the pavement and then heaved into the middle of the road didn't have any blood around it okay mm. Uh, and it supposedly had his head to head just hacked off um, because fake blood is terribly difficult to do. You see, with the marathon, Boston Marathon in America, I think shortly before Lee Rigby, they yes. did this fake blood, which is bright red, but mm. blood goes brown afterwards. Yes. And, and, it goes and darker, yes. It goes darker, yeah. So, mm. so the bright red blood looks totally absurd after a bit. Uh, and, yes. And that, they can't really, so you can't really have fake blood. Uh, and I think I, I think that's why the Lee Rigby they, they didn't do the blood as it were. Um, but th they had some alleged Muslims being interviewed, waving an axe around, and just standing there being interviewed. I saw that, and that was like done as though it was from a cell phone. Whether it was from a cell phone or not, I don't know. But it was it was presented in a way that the shape of the film was vertical, and it was just the profile of the of the man holding what looked like something that you couldn't even chop up a hamburger with. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of hired actors standing in the background. Uh, standing and the old lady doing her shopping, of course, going past. Oh, so going in other past. words, they close the whole yeah. area off. There's a madman down there with an axe goat down there. Well, I've got to go to Sainsbury's before it closes, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they had, they had closed off the whole area, which the police yes. did beforehand. Um, if you actually go to the site, there's constant traffic going through it. Um, mm. uh, and... Uh, and uh, so in every way, we don't need to go into all the details, but in every no, way... No, I, I think event. just to give an overview, Nick, of the other events that we were sort of talking about on the way that yeah. terrorism's gone, but we're really yeah. here today to talk about 7-7 on the anniversary to that, which is the London bombings. Right. And well, it sets up I, a new th th theatrical art form yes. um, of where it's difficult to tell what is real and what isn't. That, that, is, the, um, that is the aim of the exercise, that you, you, you're, you're, you're supposed to be fooled by... Um, by, by looking at what happened, um, I suppose with the seven seven event, you, you had 
you had these guys really told to come up to London. They really were four young men who were planning to come up to London. And they probably were uh, uh, intending to be where they were supposed to be. They were told to get onto the trains and by the one on the bus, you know. Yes. And um, th so it was the perfect crime, really. Uh, and it all went wrong with the trains being delayed. Uh, and, yes. And, got, and I got think you were delay. the only one to actually point this out, Nick. So I think you should take some credit for that and talk about that. And tell, oh, okay. tell the audience. Oh, OK. Well, I was with, um, uh, uh, there was a story. Somebody at Leeds... Oh, sorry, Luton said it's about the trains being delayed. These these three young men, three of them from Luton, drove down very early that morning to to sorry, from Leeds. They drove down very early to Luton station. Now they were due to get a train, which was the seven forty, uh, catch that train and come up to King's Cross. And there they'd been briefed about the exciting things they were supposed to do. These were just totally apolitical young men. No, 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 particularly, they weren't particularly religious. They were just into, you know, playing cricket and smoking a bit of dope and getting their exam results and their girlfriends. That's all they were into. Uh, and uh, so they had it, thought it was an exciting day out. Uh, they'd been probably by a piece of power, probably talked them into it. And uh, well, let's so go they... into that, Nick, because this is a long time ago for a lot of people. I mean, we we were there at the time and we remember the news reports, but other people may not. So, Peter Power was a kind of intelligence person who arranged this terror drill yeah. for some Israeli businessmen on the same yeah. day, same day as 7-7 yeah. at the yeah. same stations. And then he same comes station. on the telly and goes, yeah. to my astonishment, the bombs went off at the very stations we were doing the terror drill at. Yeah. And I've still got the hairs on my head standing up from the... Of course, um, he still had the hairs on his back of his standing up, yes. So he confessed. Why did he come out yeah. and confess? Because if he didn't, he kind of realised that he was too closely into the whole thing and he'd be liable to be tried in, for, uh, as a suspect. So he decided to come out. That, again, wasn't supposed to happen at all. He came out at okay. 5 o'clock that yes. afternoon and declared all that. Right. Now, yes. th those lads, it's very likely Peter Power drove up uh, in the car park at Luton and gave them their rucksacks um, uh, uh, when they arrived uh, for them to then get on the train. That 740 train was totally cancelled. Me and another guy, we went up and we were very fortunate to get the train timetable from the station manager at Luton and also the train timetable from somebody at King's Cross. We had the actual data of when the trains, and that was crucial. All the trains that morning were delayed due to leaves on the line or something. And those, those lads simply could not have got to London when they were supposed to get there. That was the key thing that went wrong with the whole government story. And uh, a year later, it was announced in Parliament that that 740 train didn't run and therefore they must have got some other train. And actually, there just wasn't any other train that would do to get them where they were supposed to be uh, because they'd already released alleged fake CCTV showing the lads in King Cross Station. So, and we actually went there at the time, Nick. They've changed King's Cross Station now completely, obviously. But yeah. at the time, you, to get to the Thames Link from the Tube, we timed it. And oh, it took right. a long yeah. time. And yeah. we were there, and it would have been impossible at that time of day for them to basically get to where they were meant to be if they were the real suspects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what we believe really happened, there was then Inquest had a moving account of uh, during the terrific chaos, all the passengers were seething up from onto King's Cross platform uh, after the explosions, terrible explosion on the underground that had gone off, right? Uh, 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 this is about 10 minutes to nine. Uh, and uh, people were seething all around King's Cross. And those lads turned up and they asked the guards some of the questions. Can, can I see the station manager? Lindsay Germain said that. Uh, and as if he wanted to say something. Or, or, or uh, announce something, uh, and it was dawning on them. It slowly dawned on them that they were going to be blamed for this. I think that's yes. what's, what's likely to happen. So what they did, they rushed back to the platform they just got off at, um, and, and uh, a few stations later, they entered at uh, Wharf, um, uh, Canary Wharf, yep. uh, uh, which is quite near and easy to get to. They didn't really know hardly knew London at all, and that is where they were shot. There were loads of reports, of newspaper reports of security. There's actually a plaque up there, Nick. Did you know that there's a plaque in Canary Wharf where they were shot? Three men no. were shot here. Very strangely, yes. I, I no, went up there years it? ago and saw it. It may not be there now, but it was oh, there yeah. about Amazing. between five and seven years ago. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so the the actual story that came onto LBC at the time yeah. was that three men have been shot at Canary Wharf. Then it was white. Yeah. That was 11 o'clock in the morning, because I remember that morning. vividly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yes. terribly important. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So all around the world, that, that reported loads, but, but not in this country. They blocked out reports of it. Uh, uh, you weren't allowed to hear that. Uh, but but there, there were loads of reports, other, other countries that did report that. And as soon as they'd managed to shoot those guys, then they could safely broadcast their story. Because the, the, obviously these, these guys were supposed to have been on the trains that blew up, you know. Um, yes. uh, and on I the think we should that, also uh, say where they were going to go. It's alleged that they were on their way to Reuters to report that they'd been set up, which is probably the worst place you could go anyway. But something like that, yeah. Wanted to do. Yeah. yeah, maybe. They didn't know London very well, but they, mm. they might have thought that Canary Wharf was some place they could um, t report what they were doing or somehow escape or whatever. So mm. they met their doom there. Uh, and uh, the government could then project its story. And you had, um, you had trains blown up around Edgware Road, uh, Liverpool Street, um, and King's Cross, uh, and uh, you had the Tavistock Square, the the, bon the, the, the bus uh, miraculously had its top blown off, and a whole lot of people were standing up on the top deck, hanging around. Um, yes, we can get into that a bit later. I think what we should do now is play the first part of 7-7 Revisited, which we made, uh, um, actually uploaded. So we can say we uploaded it on the 22nd of August 2010, and it's you and David right. Shaler, and we all met up at the Betjeman pub in King's Cross, I think, and we proceeded to go up to Luton on the train. So here's that first episode of 7-7 Revisited. Right. Would never be accepted by a judge in a court of law as identification of the force, simply because you can't see their faces on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course there would be corroboration if that was a genuine picture, because there is a camera just the other side of that door, which would then photograph all four of them as they came through, at least inside profile, we don't have that. And again, I can say from being a, a counter-terrorist officer, that in evidential cases, a policeman goes there and swears under oath with any picture taken off a CCTV tape is a true representation of that tape. Yeah. Now, in the absence of that sworn statement, that, that picture is not evidence, basically. Yeah, I mean, in my book, I, I, I took the view that all four had probably been photoshopped in. Uh, all four look really suspicious, especially this bar here going through Khan. You've got, you've got this bar going through his head, OK, and that bar going through his waist. Now, I'll just get down so you can see where Khan's head would be. It goes right through his face like that, OK? In the famous picture you've all yeah. seen. You see, Tanweer and Hasub Hussain really did hire a car, and they probably did come down to London on that day. Uh, Tanweer hired his little Nissan Micra on the 1st of July. He had it for that week, right? Buzzing all around Leeds that week in his car, and Hasub Hussain really did tell his parents that he was going up to London on the afternoon before, so the afternoon of July the 6th. He told them that he loved the big eye, all sort of big sights of London. It gives him a big thrill. He's going up with his friend. Um, probably, maybe the morning July some or else the evening before, uh, one of those. So those two really did go. Did they come here? Did they meet Lindsay from, uh, from Aylesbury? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, well, one of the observations I've made is that the pictures taken from the so-called practice run on the 28th of June uh, before the 7-7, uh, are much clearer. Totally. And much more easier to identify. And they've got proper time stamps and date stamps on them. Yeah, exactly. That, that is the real thing. Uh, and uh, as you say, three of them, not four, really, really did come up to London on the 28th. And they had good time. I mean, we've been shown pictures of the fiendish terrorist Sid Khan on the 28th of June in front of Madame Two Swords eating an ice cream. <laughs> well, what, what more proof do you want? Yeah, exactly, yeah. But that whole idea of them being in London has been shored up by those 28th of June pictures. I mean, sometimes even me, a trained observer, I'll see those in the papers and think, oh my God, we're all wrong. And so I think, oh no, of course, it's the practice run again, yeah. Yeah, notice the first anniversary of July the 7th, when the rolling news broadcast were telling everybody how to be frightened of terrorists, the pictures they kept showing, minus the timestamps, were those 28th of June CCTV images. Yeah, and we've seen something very similar with 9-11, uh, where the one CCTV we saw 
uh, was of these so-called hijackers uh, on uh, getting on a feeder flight. It wasn't from actually the airports where the planes are supposed to have taken off, basically. Yeah. And again, when they talk about CCTV and the fact we've got so much of it in London, they always say it's there to protect us. But it seems to be whenever anything does go wrong, the CCTV is never there. Yeah, there was absolutely nothing they could show for the first two years, any CCTV, any credible witness whatsoever in London. It's only three years later, the so-called uh, July 7th trial at Kingston, and they produce this very dodgy looking pictures of uh, Tanwir and, and the three of them, uh, four of them here, apparently moving towards that uh, entry door. Three years late, well, I'm afraid that's a bit too late for us to believe them. A few weeks after July the 7th, uh, I came up here, we interviewed passengers, and we discovered we got the official database of the trains that morning that there had been no 740 train and all the trains had been cancelled by, uh, just delayed by 20 minutes due to overhead power line troubles. And that was the real crack in the government story. The perfect crime had been devised. 52 people killed, hundreds of Londoners injured, and that cancellation of the key train was the uh, flaw in their perfect crime. It's and quite funny, isn't it? Underinvestment in the transport infrastructure kind of saves civilization. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, a whole year after 7 7, they bring up the official report, and guess what? The official report still has the 740 train. Now, there's some dispute about that, wasn't there? Because what happened was that then came out in The Guardian. And the government said, we got it off the police, but the police denied that. They said they were never responsible for saying it was a 740 train. And again, this feeds into the idea that there's some kind of script that's just devised somewhere in government or the intelligence service is that everybody else accepts uncritically and without any evidence to back it up. Well, a year after John Reid tells the House of Commons, oh, no, there wasn't a 740 train, they must have got the 725. Oh, yeah. Well, on the Kingston trial, they released a picture of... Uh, of, of one of them coming out of, of the station at 7.15. Uh, and and uh, then the four of them are seen coming in at 7.21. Now, somebody's got their times badly wrong here, that they can't go out. Lindsay, Lindsay comes out, goes to the car park, uh, gets his fatal rucksack with all the suicide bomb equipment in, gives the lads the tickets, explains that all the train times are up the creek, uh, and then comes back here in six minutes, do me a favour. The time's quite impossible. Yeah, and it would be pretty difficult if they were photographed, because it's actually 7.21 and 54 seconds, so it's virtually 7.22. Even getting up there and getting on a train in that time would be very, very difficult, even allowing for the fact that, that train actually leaves at 7.25. I note that Andy Heim Heyman, head of the Counter-Terror Command, came out with his book about uh, of, of the 7 7 story, which is the nearest we'll ever get to a government story, okay? And in that book, which came out last year, four years after the event, he still has the 740 train running. Those lads still get the 740, and the CCTV on the train records them. 740, that's part of the original story, don't forget. And Andy Heyman still has that. Yeah, I mean, it's very curious. It could be him trying to call to us for help. I mean, one of my interpretations of that Home Office narrative is it is so deeply flawed, it's almost like people behind the scenes saying, look, we know there's something going on here. We know it's an inside job. Our hands are tied in government. But please, we're letting you know that, basically. I get just the same impression from this fake Photoshop picture of the four here. It's not just a Photoshop forgery. It is such a bad Photoshop forgery. A whole lot of incredible errors and, and botched up with bits of bodies patched together, you know, and, and the, the foot and the impossible angle. Uh, it's done so badly, it's like someone saying, hey, look, I don't like doing this, but anyone with half a brain can see that Khan wasn't there. I'll tell you what the Khan picture right. right? Khan is the one the railing goes through his head. It reminds me of the announcement that Khan's remains are found at three different locations in London, at, at Allgate, at Tamsot Square, and, uh, isn't it Piccadilly? Yeah. Those yeah. three locations, they all find the remains of Sid Khan. Well, I think that's the way of the perps, the perps telling us, look, we don't like having to do this, but we've got to do it. And for anyone with half a brain, this is our message that Khan actually wasn't there that, that morning. It's almost like they take satisfaction in, in kind of, in a sense, getting away with them. That's the whole thing I thought about the picture taken outside Luton at 7.21. Yeah. It's almost like them saying, look, we're going to give you this completely cockeyed picture that's really obviously photoshopped. We're going to put it in the national press and no the national press is going to mention no, that. Nobody, because nobody that's, at all. that's how powerful we are. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's a bit powerful. like the that's death powerful. of Dr. Kelly. It's kind of like, well, OK, they can do these things. You expect the intelligence services to bump off dissidents they don't like. But the fact the mainstream media doesn't even speculate that he might have been murdered at all at the time. No. 
no. is there almost like their assertion of power saying look we control the media so keenly that nobody even dares speculate about this yeah okay let's come back to whether khan was here at all mohammed sadiq khan it was a major luminary celeb and action hero in the Beeson area looked after school helped school kids help little girls going to school on time uh, he'd been to the House of Commons, his family had been to the Buckingham Palace. He was a rising star, you know. Now, his wife had him drive her to the hospital where she was expecting a child on the Tuesday, two days before, right? 5th of July, she stayed in hospital in that little Nissan Micra, OK? The real Nissan Micra. And then, that is the last time she ever sees him. She is frantically trying to call her husband. Where is he? He's got, he's got this beautiful young wife just expecting their second child and what happens to him. Now, she's under acute and terrible stress and on the morning of 7-7, she has a miscarriage. This is uh, uh, Frida Patel uh, and what happens to her, uh, she has a miscarriage and I think that's a very poignant uh, that uh, he just wasn't around. He couldn't have just gone off the morning and left his wife to have a miscarriage uh, uh, and not having visited her. That's just not on the cards. And, and she just, she said she never came across anything remotely suggesting he might be terrorist. Everyone remembers him, remembers his, his gentleness and his commitment to non-violence. So uh, I, I think, I, I don't accept actually that you've got any evidence of Khan being on this, uh, this July 7th uh, journey. Yeah, no, I, I mean, something very weird happens that, that day. Obviously, they have a certain narrative, a certain plan, and obviously those things don't happen. It's a bit yeah. like 9-11. They're, they're, once people start to awaken to these things, they're constantly firefighting to try and stop this stuff coming out that is so patently obvious, i.e. the lack of CCTV images, the lack of witness reports and so yeah. on. Uh, but clearly something does go wrong that day. But I don't think any of those four guys get to London or even get to Luton. I actually think there's, there's something going wrong before that even. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I can't hear you, Mark. No, do you remember that day, Nick? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I must say, Mark, that um, it's great having that rap with Shayla, but I think our story has changed since then. Mm -hmm. You see, initially, we thought none of those guys got to London because yes. there was no credible CCTV. That was our initial yes, story. Yes, that was early on. And yeah. obviously, more came out later. Yes. Yeah, I think it's very much exactly. to do with Murr Mur Dibbs' video. Uh, it's brilliant. What, what, what was it called? Um, it was called 7 7 Ripple Effect, and it was made effect. by yeah, yeah, somebody called yeah. Anthony John Hill, who was yeah, actually yeah. put in prison for 150 days at the time yeah. of the Kingston trial. Yeah. And he That's was right, alleged yeah. to have perverted the course of justice by sending his DVD of the film to the court. But of course, the jury yeah. never got it. It was intercepted no. by court staff, but they thought they'd better get him out of the way during the time yeah. of the trial. And that was the time when I met him, and that was the time when I think you visited him in prison. Oh, right, yeah. Well, it was a very good video. I recommend it. Mm. Uh, and he intuited that they had arrived too late. The story we told earlier, mm. they arrived too late, they met all these million crowds, and, and they, they then ended up at Canary Wharf. And everything since then validates his intuition. What we said earlier where um, Mohammed Sadiq Khan wasn't there that day at all, but the other three... Yes, that's really important. That's really important that we get that into the, the show because Khan was not there. That's why they photoshopped him in, but the other three were. Yeah, and that's partly why they couldn't that's... release any, any CCTV. Yes. Not only was it all too late, but Khan wasn't there. Uh, yes. I think those were the major problems, inhibiting them from releasing any CCTV. But uh, so just to add to that interview with rap we did with Shayla, um, mm -hmm. I, I think that they did eventually, they did get to London, but, but mm -hmm. too late. That's the yes, and there was some dispute as to the route as well, which is very interesting, because when, I think what it is, what we have to do is piece together what we can from the evidence we're given. And this is part of the job of a real journalist, which, of course, we yeah. don't have any in this country anymore, because no, they just no, follow no, no. the controlled um, media narrative. But that was an interesting thing because the route taken by the three of them um, meant that they there was CCTV allegedly at Woodall Services on the way to Luton um, from right, Leeds, yeah, yeah. and that. 
But they, they said that a certain route had been taken with no actual proof they took that route. And that was something else that was brought up a bit later in the video. Because at the time that video was made, 7-7 uh, Seven Seven Revisited, we were not in possession of some of these facts which came out later. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I remember them. Yeah, the CCTV at a filling station. That's one of the few genuine yes. bits of CCTV mm -hmm. released on, on that day. Show that very cheerful looking couple. They're buying a lot of sweets and stuff. Uh, and and uh, they didn't look the least bit suicidal. Um, they, they, they looked like they were having a good time. Uh, so, so that was genuine CCTV release. Yeah. Um, yes. Let's get on now to the tube train damage, Nick, because that was another big story, an anomaly, with the holes in the bottom of the tube trains. Certainly was, yeah. That was that's a... You looked into because the three tube trains that were blown up were all taken away and they were taken away from public view and nobody ever saw them again. Is that right? No, but no journalist yeah. was allowed to see them. They went to some, no. was it Farnborough, uh, uh, army, army Depot? Yes, um, I don't know if that's right. There, but as mm. if some terrific mystery and... Um, part of the story the, the official story where was the hole in the coach you thought that's a fairly straightforward thing you might even expect that journalists would be allowed to see the hole in the coach by this amazingly spectacular terror event oh no no and then there was a debate among people on on and, and so the hole in the coach moved from one set of double doors to another um because uh of uh people who are survivors who are on the coach talking so I think that's another point is the witnesses, Nick, because you looked into some of the witnesses' stories as well. That would be a good thing to bring up. Yeah, well, it was much too spread out to be a, a, mm. a, a bomb, somebody sitting in a, in a, in a, on a seat having a bomb. It wasn't a single centre like that. People who got their feet and ankles and legs blown off were, as it were, spread along the carriage. It was much more something underneath the train that, that blew up and it was seen more, more spread out. For the Edgware coach, the whole entire coach was lifted off the rails. People experienced that. Uh, and the the uh, the steel of the floors was bent upwards. Um, uh, and uh, so, so nobody, all the interrogations they had of survivors, none of them had any credible memory of the terrorists allegedly sitting where they were supposed to be sitting or recognising it. Uh, and uh, th there was nothing... It wasn't really anything like a, a, a bomb blast uh, g going off. It was um, whatever. Can it was, we right, sort right. of describe what those people actually had the sensation of? Because it was quite interesting what they actually said, and I think you put that into your book, Terror on the Tube. Well, that it they was reported yeah. almost being like stuck to their seats, and there was a lot of electrical friction reported. If Certainly I remember, it was right. yeah. yeah, lights and electrical friction. And I got the distinct impression that the shattering of the windows was blown, they're blown inwards rather than outwards, uh, as if something maybe outside the coach was, was ex exploding. Um, uh, and uh, it wasn't a, a, like a terrific bang that they uh, heard. Uh, it was, uh, as you say, more uh, strange electrical effects that they, they seemed to report. And it was more spread out along the carriage. Yeah. And uh, especially, yeah, and what about the... the holes, Nick? Because the holes that uh, there was a photograph that I think you published in Terror on the Tube with these holes which looked as though they had been blown out from underneath. That's actually in your book, isn't it? Um, well, th th they conjectured that. And as I right. said, th 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 with the Edgware Road, there seemed to be three different holes. Oh, I remember now. You, they, 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 the photograph, you couldn't see exactly the, the, the hole of the floor. I remember now what the. No, the insert the carriage. The, yeah, the, the yeah. survivors at your road seemed to describe three different holes, uh, and uh, uh, so that was ra ra rather rather puzzling. But uh, so someone's just put in Nick. That's quite interesting. They put uh, the no face has put in. I remember the BBC showing one of the carriages being transported in the early hours of the morning away from the scene, but it was only shown once, and I remember it looking like it had imploded. Had imploded. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then the bus, uh, where the top lifted off, and uh, we talk about Tavistock up. Square now. The Tavistock Square bus. Yeah, you might expect they all yeah. to have noses bleeding or ears ears totally damaged. Um, I think I think there was one one guy with nose bleeding. Yeah, the bus had obviously been pre-prepared for the top to lift off, and uh, 
or grilling of the witnesses. There's supposed to be this huge giant fellow, Hassi Hussein, with a big rucksack. No, nobody, nobody recorded him at all. And um, people sitting next to where they said he was on the upstairs seats uh, did not get there. You know, were not sort of blown to bits by a terrific blast. Um, or have their legs no, there's no bad up injuries up there, from what I remember. And there was two old ladies who were complaining about their teeth. Yeah, I seem to yeah. remember that. It's yeah. a much more spread out. I think it was very strange. Mm. Uh, it's a shame that people weren't more into looking at the strange. It looked more as though the, 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 the top had been already kind of loosened or, or, or cut off, and then it had just it was, blown yeah, yeah. off yeah. quite simply yeah, but, with, with yeah, some very, very minor so. explosion. So, in Tone, other words, yeah. it would be something yeah. that wouldn't kill anyone but would blow the roof off because the, yeah. there was no kind of crumpling of it. It, it. it didn't look as though it had been part of the bus. It looked like it just been lifted off, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. And then a um, whole lot of people standing up afterwards on the top deck. I think the mirror offered a reward if any of those would come forward and um, say what happened. I don't, I don't think they got anyone. Um, so it's all rather mysterious. I, I looked around that bus, all the photographs. I found two apparently dead bodies, possibly three. So I, I'm, I'm not into the 13 they said allegedly died there. I think it started off with three, then it went to 13, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, went up to that. Yeah, Jethro's just put in. Wasn't there an Australian woman that lost a leg on a bus? On the bus, I think he might be referring to the train there because the 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 train injuries were all lower body, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, Um, on the bus at thirteen, it was was devised on the concept of a a pack of cards. You see, you have fifty-two dead altogether, and uh, I think there was twenty-six. Wasn't there twenty-six at one place? Uh, anyway, 13 had to be on the bus. So I think that various of those deaths, which are written now at Tavistock Square, allegedly on the bus, would have been taken from the underground um, and attributed to Tavistock Square. Um, don't forget, there was no post-mortems on any of these bodies, which was extremely weird. If, if yes. you had That's another bodies. point, isn't it? Uh, this is where the narrative gets completely controlled. And I think we, we've seen examples of that with what happened during COVID as well. So it's not just terrorism, the, yeah. the lack of post-mortems. And, and we have to remember, of course, that, um, that the post-mortems are not generally accurate as to what people died of. They're what the uh, pathologist believes they died of. So uh-huh. we have to be, be careful with all of this stuff. So nothing's absolute. But um, Jethro put in, she, this woman who had her leg blown off was all over the telly on, in Australia, he said. Aha, uh-huh. right. But weren't they the dancing couple on the train as well to go back to the train? Yeah, the, the couple who were like ballroom dancers. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they got a lot of publicity, didn't they? Yeah, yes, yeah. Um, I suppose we're chopping about here, but it's because there's people in chat. So, um, well, well, it's, it's the, good the to get their is, input. Point, yeah, I think they were totally real deaths. Whereas later, mm-hmm. you see, later on, you get fabricated terror events which are just actors and dummies, and I think that's what we're used to the last, you know, ten years or so. Um, uh, that, that you don't have real blood anymore, but uh, well, I think it's a for... sea change in what society has become through the communitarian system. In other words, that you are bound to believe the state narrative, and if you don't, then you're yeah. just a conspiracy theorist. So it's a lot easier to do these things for the greater good or the funding and the um, positioning of the world as it is now under sustainable development, under this Agenda 2030 plan, it all goes together because everything yeah. now is working in unison. Whereas before, these terror events were to advance different agendas for war. Now the whole yeah. idea is that there's this globalization. So everybody right. sticks to the same narrative and there will not there will not be an end to pandemics and terrorism until everybody is brought under this narrative and that's basically what ted ross says at the world health organization the pandemic will stop when people comply sure that's i'm paraphrasing but it's it's chilling when you see these things being said and you know what the undercurrent of the meaning actually is it means that if you're going to try and challenge this you have no chance and that's the audacity of it really i think and there was as, a huge as, amount. As, yes as pierce corbyn says resist defy do not comply <laughs> we do not comply <laughs> yeah well this is 
very interesting as to the way the governance systems have changed, I think, the way that terrorism is now approached. So in other words, the days of multiple deaths are probably over for the time being, but that doesn't mean they're not going to come back. But what I think we see now is the use of patsies who are deemed to be terrorists that were caught in the act or right. they they either get stitched up or they get convinced into taking somebody out. And that's where this element right. of, well, who are these patsies and where do they come from? Because that's an incredibly important thing, especially when we look at the Joe Cox assassination, which we actually went up to. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, there's so many question Tom marks. Met. There's so, so many, many question, question marks, marks there, yes, around, around the alleged culprit, you see. Yeah, so this I, is the I, I, thing. What, what, it all comes down again to we're, not, we're never allowed to question the narrative and the culprit is silenced. We never hear yeah, anything yeah, from the yeah. culprit. Whoever, well, the, 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 the patsy, whoever the, like the four lads in this case of London bombing, then you're never allowed to hear their point of view. Uh, either, they either die or they're put in jail forever. Uh, and the other fairly sure thing you can say about them is that they are known to the authorities. They're known to MI5. Yes. Uh, in some way, they're groomed. and They're given some expectation, which is very different from what uh, finally happens to them. Uh, and uh, so, so they're set up by the authorities. This was uh, a known thing in East London, Nick, because the, it was known and reported that MI5 were within those mosques and they were looking for people to recruit. I remember wow. Press TV did a story on it. There was somebody who lived in East Ham. He was a yeah. devout Muslim, and he was followed by MI5 all over the place. There was actually a documentary made <laughs> by Press TV about that. Wow. And once they target people, it seems they're relentless. So it doesn't matter if these people don't comply. They are driven mm -hmm. insane by the constant gaslighting and abuse that they're getting from these authority figures oh, who right. are involved in counterterrorism. All oh, right. Well, and I think that's that the, the very sinister thing. Yeah, four lads involved here, the seven seven. Uh, probably Mohammed Sadiq Khan was the main guy they all looked up to, and so he would have been approached by the authorities. Um, I, I, I think he, he had been uh, talking to them. That they'd approached him about, I, I don't know, crime, not crime in the area or whatever, because uh, his family was greatly respected, um, and and, and um, you know his mother had been to Buckingham Palace and stuff. Uh, and he, he was a rising star, and, and he was he so he would have approached, and he would have uh, told his friends, "Look, we've got a fun day out. Let, let's let's do this," you know. So I, I think that that would have been the source whereby they managed to uh, get those lads to agree to do it. Yes, um, I think also it's the idea of it being an exercise that they're involved in, and this is another thing that we've heard a lot about. In recent years, people talk about crisis actors, but of course, these people have always existed. And it's a known thing. Take it down to a local level, for instance. Let's get off the terrorism track because that's quite oh, serious. Right. But on a local level, if there's yeah. some kind of garden fate, it won't be local people that are photographed by the, by the newspaper or these communitarian kind of information sheets that get put out by local councils. It will be actors. And people used to tell me this all the time. And this was 10 to 15 years ago. So even if it's like a flower show, they yeah. won't interview a member of the public. They'll get a picture of someone who's used to posing for a camera. And when you think about it, it makes sense. But this is where the lines get blurred. So yeah. people will be involved in things on the fringes of things that they don't really even know about. For instance, with the Woolwich incident, those uh -huh. kids on the bus were filmed at a different time. Right. This yeah. was all came out, didn't it? So yeah. the, the bus clip we saw of a bus which allegedly stopped uh, because of this horrific event was not even on that day. Yeah, that's so important. When, when, they, important. when they bring in this library footage, Nick, I mean, this is a, a really good point, I think, for people out there, because when you're watching something, question what you're watching. You're watching a series of pictures over a narration. Does yeah. the narration actually go with the pictures? And what's the narration trying to imply with the pictures going over it? Yeah, and this is so very important. basic yeah. stuff. But yeah. it, when you are able to look at that, you, you have to then question everything that he's put together as a news report. Yeah, yeah. I remember with the Westminster Bridge event uh, in 2017, there was, I think there was a lot of prior filming. That, that, that they, they, they do what they can to film previously. And people notice there's different weather patterns in the sky hmm. uh, from uh, different days of filming. Uh, 
so, so the, the, as you say, they, they have footage they've done before that they can use and, and uh, splice in as part of the narrative, yeah. And I think also it's laziness, because if you've got someone like the BBC, they will just go, oh, we need some library footage of a bus, and people will go, oh, that's the bus. You know, they, you have to question everything to do with this stuff, especially now, because we're on a post-truth world, and everything has got worse. I mean, there are no journalists out there anymore. There it's are right, the fewer... right, isn't it? I, yes. I mean, what happened to British newspapers? Uh, 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 how come they all uh, just print the same thing? and uh, None of them are worth reading, really. Um, uh, well, they all uh, follow the same kind of patterns. It's interesting because you have the the UK Guardian and Independent, which appeal to the complete brainwashed types who believe everything from climate change to yeah, God, as, as you said, whatever you story said comes in. In your uh, thing yesterday, you sang uh, the other day. Your musician friends, the Guardian is or worst newspapers on earth. Uh, hmm. And uh, I mean, that used to be quite a discriminating last century paper, uh, sort of for the liberal conscience of, of, of you know, what is right and what is wrong. And you, you take notice of its editorials. And uh, so it's it's a bit, uh, bit shocking what has happened to it. Yeah. So, yeah, what do you think the direction of terrorism will be? Have you got any idea what that could be in the future? Well, for I can see, we're, we're, we're heading into this the, the, the maddest possible scenario of war with Russia, uh, which has happened since uh, we've agreed that the anti-Muslim thing ended rather abruptly, or at least the big events, 2017. And 2018, we got Scripple with the Novichok fantasy. And the whole Novichok thing started off as a, as a thriller, a mid-Atlantic TV thriller series uh, involving a Russian spies and so on yes that that was before the scripple event shortly before yeah, in fact yeah. it was ongoing during the scripple event and yeah. then you had an army terror drill on uh, salisbury plain all about chemical warfare so the whole thing was converging and then you had scripple on his park bench with a daughter and uh, uh that, that was a totally fabricated thing very very complicated with this imaginary thing novichok which then came to acquire the semblance of reality and then it, it, it worked so well they did it again with Navalny in 2020 for demonizing Russia. Uh, and uh, so that was that is a different kind of terror event. And it started off with back in 2006, Litvinenko, Polonium, uh, mm. and, and, and fan, imagining somebody really dies, right? But um, then the whole Russian connection is imaginary. Uh, and uh, uh, that th th they weave their hate and fear story out of uh, out of out, out of this, and it's given to the papers, and nobody questions it, uh, 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 and that's what takes us towards war. That the mental laziness of the people that believe these fabricated terror events, which the government or, or the intelligence services brew up. That the people in intelligence think they're fighting some sort of cold war. They think they're some sort of James Bond type agents you know, NATO, uh, Atlantic Solidarity, and they make up these stories. Um, and uh, if you ask them why they're making up these diabolical straight from hell narratives, they'd probably say something about, quote, Churchill, you know, truth must be surrounded by a bodyguard of liars. Um, and, um, well, there's so always a justification for it. And the new justification for it is, of course, that it's for the common good of everybody. And if a few people die, well, that doesn't really matter. That's well, the whole more point. than a few yeah. people. If we get a war with Russia, yeah. which no, is I'm what... talking about terrorism, really. I mean, right. there won't be a war with Russia because there's a new system in place. But I think that they there will be threats of it, and there will yeah. be back and forth threats. Right. But I think that the problem is that, especially with the UK, people have been totally brainwashed by the Ukraine thing. I don't think that brainwashing is as deep in any other country that I've been to. Not that I'm saying I've been to loads of countries. I mean, but that is so amazing, Europe. isn't it? Yeah, yes. it's so amazing. I mean, the British absolute determination to promote that war. Uh, I, I mean, look at Boris Johnson. He single-handedly stopped a peace negotiations in Istanbul uh, at the end of March, beginning of April. Russia and Ukraine, they'd more or less agreed on a peace solution, and he comes along and stops it. He says, oh, no, they mustn't negotiate. Uh, 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 but I think so. the, the thing is that also... Behind the scenes, there's a lot of stuff going on, especially with 
that sort of conflict that you're talking about because there is a lot of strategy behind the scenes which the public never seem to pick up on. And that's one thing I do get quite bored with is the fact that they can't read between the lines of what's actually being said. But what we're talking yeah. about today, yeah. and we're here for, is to talk about 7-7 and the aftermath of it. And I think we've done that um, to some degree, and we've brought yeah. in other well, aspects I, 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 as well. I, I, as you say, the stories themselves mm. are so fragmentary and incredible, uh, and it's the fear that blocks out rational analysis. I mean, you look at 7-7, but what was the explosive that was used? The first story of the explosive was a real explosive. It's called C4. They That's had right. real experts yes. come. Yes. And that uh, prompt, quite likely what was actually used, yeah. blow up uh, underneath the trains. Then that became, uh, oh, the, the, these clueless looking guys from... Yes, they knew nothing about bomb making. That was nothing something it, that no. came out. No. So, so they had a... to make the bomb look really simple. And they made it look so simple, it was like a kind of pantomime. Yeah, yeah. I think you describe uh, it as a pantomime. Yeah, yeah they, they said, oh, COCP. But then they realised that would need quite complicated apparatus and strong hmm. strong hydroperoxide, which I couldn't possibly get, and strong sulfuric acid. And that was all more and more impossible. They, they had a bath where they claimed it was all made. But, I mean, was that? Yes, so there they was finally, some kind of bubbling, bubbling liquid in there, and that stayed liquid, as part yeah. of the yeah. official narrative in yeah. the and that, book and then, that came out. Yeah. And then it finally ends up with... Black pepper and hydrogen peroxide, and I think flour, uh, and that is supposed to be an explosive. Uh, and there that's the chapati flour bombs as well, of course, that uh, were reported about the same time. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but there was another plot in northeast London because I used to live in Walthamstow, and there was a plot to blow up airliners with uh, hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, it's always hydrogen peroxide. It, it got plot. really silly though. It and does. Yeah, after it does. Seven seven. It, I think the the story's got more silly because of the need to make the explosive devices extremely simple yeah exactly uh, the, the, the need to make them simple but they wouldn't work they're not actually possible and no. uh, uh the, the public just go along with this because of the fear um it, it's the projection of fear that has a terrible effect in suppressing rational debate uh, and and normal thought, pro thought processes that, that uh, the thing is is incredible uh, so i think that's part of the the, the, the tragedy of our culture that it, it's gone along with these fabricated terror narratives without uh, analytical discussion. Uh, I mean, what we'd all like is some sort of, I don't know, seminar where different points of view are thrown together and people hear each other's point of view. And that cannot happen at all. Uh, just we dissidents are damned and condemned. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, you're a danger to the government. Uh, 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 as, as if the government cannot endure hearing a different narrative. Jethro's just put in, is the ridiculous nature of the narrative an accident or is it mocking the public? Well, I think it's a bit a bit of both um, because they these people do make mistakes, but in a way they are mocking the public. And I had an example of that from someone that we know, Nick, and he said that he was asking about 7-7 and one of the right. children in the class or boys in the class knew right. about it and said his father had been involved in it. All right. And they were laughing at it. So that's that's audacity, isn't it? That's yeah. incredible audacity that yeah. somebody involved in uh, a state-backed event would actually tell their children about it and they would be yeah. voting over you it. You always wish a bit like this would leak out. I mean, what's so frustrating mm. telling the story is that you end up with a lot of question marks uh, and, and, and uh, you can't get to really... Well, this is the thing. Happened. This is where we have to be very strict, I think, with the way we conduct ourselves. Because, of course, the BBC have now got this ridiculous misinformation unit, which actually puts out yeah. complete yeah. propaganda. I mean, yeah, they, it it's a joke because yeah. they don't do any research into anything. They just take yeah. the line that, OK, these people are conspiracy theorists because they're questioning something. Well, it yeah. doesn't really work like that. I mean... The, the whole point is that they then send people on journalism courses and call it critical thinking, and they're all funded. Uh, this is the this is the main problem. And of course, we've got spineless UK people in television and media. Absolutely spineless, worthless totally, people. Yeah, the most yeah, worthless yeah. people are in media now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Credulous, obedient, and amnesiac. Uh, that they, they print what they're told, uh, and. Uh, uh, as you say, we, we've got, BBC has got a propaganda unit now, which makes it as unethical to pay your TV license. I'd say, because uh, if anyone it, still it, does, I mean, I can't imagine that anyone would want to. But 
they have degraded themselves completely yeah. as far I mean, what, as credibility goes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I may give a, a more, more up-to-date example, because uh, it was 18 years ago, the bombing, uh, with the Novichok stories, uh, they said, oh, yeah. f- absolutely deadly. Just a couple of drops of this stuff is just so deadly and lethal. Uh, and uh, no wonder we need to expel all Russian diplomats all across Europe uh, and, and so on. And then it turns out the two scribbles are both still alive, right? And then the police officer also effectively still alive. And then Navalny's poisoned. He makes a complete recovery. He's jogging over the hills, perfectly healthy. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, the, in the end, they've only got one, one person who allegedly died. And that's somebody called Dawn Sturgis. I don't know if you mm. come across her. She was oh, a, right. some sort of her, heroin addict. Yes. And she she got she went to pass. She got bad drugs, and she was sort of frothy on the floor, and she was basically dead the next day. Uh, and they managed to keep her in suspended animation in a hospital a few days, and they realised, well, hang on, this looks like Novichok. Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, god, yeah. Uh, and um, so at last, they got somebody who died of Novichok. So the cook up. Well, like Jethro's just put in baby wipes. That was the recommended cleanup, wasn't it? I think it was. Yes, because <laughs> you might get it on a door handle. You said. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So they're, they're <laughs> Make sure fucking... you've not got Novichok on the door handles, especially oh, if you're going to go to Weatherspoons, you know. Right. Because you might, so they... might, might get on the chairs or something. Yeah. I brought up this cock and bull story about how these two Russians that allegedly put it on the door handle of the scripples, then threw it away into a bin in a park. And it somehow lay, lay there for a couple of months. Ali, who goes bin hunting, bin diving. Mm-hmm picked it up and decided to give it as a birthday present to his mistress, to his, his woman, as you as you would, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. So he gives it to her and she squirts it on and, oh, bad luck. Oh, no. She started another job. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the only problem with the story is they could not find a coroner who would sign a thing saying Dawn Sturge is to die of Novichok because the police had already put out a narrative, get this, they put out a narrative that there were bad drugs and a couple of people had died of bad drugs and they were warning drug drug users in the whole neighbourhood, Amesbury, uh, not to take this, beware of any bad drugs. They're obviously referring to these two, Dawn Sturge and Charlie Rowley, who have just been in hospitals uh, with, with with bad drugs, right? Yes, I so, remember that now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so, so suddenly the whole narrative changes. Oh, no, she's got another shot. But they can't find a coroner anywhere who will put their name to signing. Yeah, died another shot. No, 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 no. So what happens? Get this. The whole thing is moved to London, the Royal Court of Justice. Mm-hmm. Because there, oh, yeah, they'll, they'll, um, there's this sleight of hand, uh, which you start off with an inquiry. And then it becomes an inquest. Is that no? Somewhere around. You start off with an inquest, and then, uh, uh, and then you claim that you've got a, a cause of death, and then he changes into an inquiry. I think that's how it's done. Yes. Um, well, the public inquiries, as we know, are there just to harvest the public's attention until they get bored yeah. and it dwindles out into nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you remember that, with the, coming back to seven seven with mm. Lady Justice Hallett, that there was a big inquiry, wasn't there? Or yes. was it an inquest? And and she tried to claim that the cause of death was known, uh, and it actually wasn't because they hadn't done any postmortems. Yes, that's that? right. Yes, exactly. Uh, 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 and uh, I'm not even sure you're allowed to have an inquest without postmortems. But um, anyway, she managed to do it, uh, and and it became an inquiry, uh, and the public got the impression that something had been sorted out or settled, which it hadn't really. Um, uh, so I think yeah. I think I think they're playing the same trick with Dawn Sturgis. Uh, they desperately want to be able to say somebody died of another job, You see, well, of course, that, that they've got nobody except uh, n- n- nobody at all in this country had died of another shock, um, uh, unless they can certify that Dawn Sturgis. Uh, and so that is that's actually still ongoing, believe it or not, in the High Court of Justice. Um, that the, the police are shuffling around, uh, claiming they're looking at papers and so on. Uh, and uh, claiming they've still got an inquiry about Dawn Sturgis. Um, I guess they hope it'll all be quietly forgotten. But um... Yes. But I think in summing up that the looking at the 7-7 film again that we made oh, and okay. the evidence, the actual way that things are done hasn't changed. 
It's just that that was probably the last big mainland terror event that Britain may ever see. There may be a bigger one. But what do you think on that, Nick? Do you think that something like 7-7 could happen again? Well, it was the biggest attack on London since the Blitz. Yes. Uh, 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 by, by the hidden hand, uh, by Mr. Nobody. Uh, and um, what's disturbing is is the lack of concern amongst Londoners to find out who, who, who did it. Um, I mean, could it happen again? Well, I mean, we're always being drenched with fear, aren't we, with the... We had the whole COVID narrative, uh, and um, was something that didn't really, never really existed. So everybody has to fear a virus, and um, just when that COVID narrative was fading out, and people were beginning to realise this monster country, what happens? Oh, we get a new war. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. War in Ukraine. Yeah, I think the the thing is that now that they believe, or the behavioural insights team believe through David Halpern that the public are ready for lockdowns and will willingly comply to whatever is thrown at them, then everything's yeah. under control. So maybe they don't need to do a terror attack anymore. Maybe the huh. divide yeah. and rule through terror is not necessary, but yeah, the divide and rule through people themselves. If they can get people arguing over masks and nonsense like that and the stuff they got them arguing over, then the divide and rule has already yeah. been achieved and the divide yeah. and rule amongst everybody is achieved rather than just through specific sections of society which is yeah. what terrorism is for, to push. So that narrative probably isn't as necessary anymore. But yeah. when you see the audacity of these people, these Cambridge-educated, useful idiots who yeah. are basically traitors to themselves and to everybody else, like how traitors, in my opinion, traitors. Oh, yeah. Traitors, um, yeah. because they are playing, they think they can play around with the minds of the public and get them to comply to whatever they want to. Well, I'm afraid that's not going to work because that has never happened in human history. Yeah, I well, we, we've got to, we've got to affirm, Mark. We've got to affirm yeah. that we're here to sort of try and be happy uh, and get along with each other. And you don't need the fear, and you certainly don't need the war. The government is trying to push onto you, uh, and uh, it, it's our business to somehow resist. Don't pay taxes for war, or uh, don't wear the mask. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I think it's down to uh, inner and outer compliance because. In countries that I've been in recently, what happens is people go, yes, yes, and then we'll do exactly what they want. So in other words, I'm in the country at the moment where probably I would say hardly anybody, if anybody, got vaccinated. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Because well, the thing is that right. there's a way around everything. And this mm -hmm. is the thing that the UK is a bit behind on. Because yeah. in different countries, people have a way of getting around things and say, oh, yeah, we'll make it look as though we're doing that. We're doing something else. And that's what people have got to learn because yeah. then that frees you up and you go, okay, well, I'm not going to do it then. And, no. and it's all, it was down to personal choice at the end of the day. Right. I think so. I think I've been good, Nick. I think that's been good. You look a bit tired because you think you've been, you've been doing several interviews today or you've been in, interviewing before this, haven't you? I did one with um, Sons of Liberty in America. Well, it's absolutely boiling hot here, and I'm sort of fading a bit. And I think we've covered a lot of ground there, and I hope it's given people stuff to think about. I'll be putting out more live streams on YouTube, but we don't put our main shows on YouTube, and I probably might even take this one down, but it will be on Odyssey. It will be on our Odyssey channel. Go to windowsontheworld.net, and do take a look at the homepage where everything is. So you can find all of our material on the homepage at windowsontheworld.net, and as it says there, new show every Sunday, 9.30 p.m. UK time, full archive of all information. Nick, your website is terrorontheTube.co.uk. I'm just going to show that one. And you put up regular blogs and information there. Yeah? Well, yeah, it's been very much attacked, that site. I can hardly control it at all, actually. Uh, <laughs> right. It's almost, almost ruined. Uh, but uh, I do still put up stuff on it, yeah. Well, that's good to hear. And can you just give us the title of this last book? which you showed us at the beginning of the show? False Flags Over Europe, Modern History of State Fabricated Terror. Uh, yeah, this is the whole whole panorama of the main art form of the 20th century uh, uh, that uh, we need to become conscious of to try and stop it happening, yeah. That's great, Nick. You've done a lot of investigations into that, going back as far as Gladio and yeah. a lot of the recent terror 
events you have covered in great detail and your book terror on the tube is still available right yeah it is yeah yeah amazing still on amazon yeah yes and that is probably the definitive book on the subject for those interested so do join us every sunday 9 30 p.m i'll get you on again nick and we'll have another conversation soon i'm just going to lead us out with the last bit of the i think it's part five or part six part six of terror on the tube um the 77 revisited and i think it was a great way of summing up something which has accelerated in the minds especially of the british people right nick has done a lot of research into this i can i've done some research myself i've brought some expertise from being a former counter-terrorist officer and it's absolutely clear that there is no evidence to implicate uh four muslims in these attacks now, if you're saying they were responsible without evidence, that is bigotry, basically. And this has been the position adopted by mainstream and alternative left-wing movements, including Stop the War. Yeah. So my message to those left-wingers is you are racist, bigots and fascists unless you can bring us the evidence of these four guys being involved, basically. And that is a real throwing and a real challenge. We've heard so many things about, you know, Islamo-fascism and so on. But to me, the worst fascism and bigotry a lot is coming from left-wing activists who really should know better. Yeah. And you know why they're doing it? Because if they, if they didn't at all, they would have to think. Their meetings would actually have to discuss issues. And this would really hurt. The Stop the War movement likes to define itself by what it's against. Uh, we're against the war. We're going to demonstrate. We're going to march. And don't have to think about anything. Yeah. And the consensus of accepting the government view means that there's no struggle with thought and evidence and so on. Uh, they can just brush that away and it all gets brushed away with a simple, single phrase, oh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Yeah. But anybody... That is always trotted out yeah. uh, and it means, go away, I don't want to think about it. And to Muslims it means, shut up and take the blame. Yeah. And Jesus in the Bible very clearly says, know thine enemy. Does he? Oh, yes. Know thine enemy is very important because the I, enemy... I, I, Jesus didn't say that, did he? <laughs> know thine enemy. Shiloh's yes. wrestling, Jesus and, said that. Yeah, yeah. and um, James the Just said something very similar. That was Jesus' brother. Aha. Uh -huh. Because he, got, he was heavily persecuted too. Aha, uh -huh, But right. I thought that was a nice way of ending it because what we have now is, yes, anything outside the official narrative is not just a conspiracy theory, you're a far-right extremist, and there is no room for debate. And it is the fake left that have introduced <laughs> this. The fake left. Totally, the yeah. fake assumed left. People who think they're left because they think they're... Well, they're basically the people who are champagne socialists and virtue-signalling idiots who believe everything they're told. And they're the people who enable state-fabricated terror they're the people who enable globalization to the detriment of everybody else on the planet. So they're to blame. And they are the biggest culprits of terrorism. And totally, well, we yeah. could call it errorism because most of it is so badly done. We could call it errorism. But I thought that was a good way to leave this particular show. There's going to be a lot more coming up over the next few weeks. So do tune into us every Sunday, 9.30 p.m. And I'll be back on here soon. We post all of our videos on Odyssey. And please subscribe to us on Spreaker homepage at winnersontheworld.net. I have to keep saying that because people keep saying, where can I find your stuff? <laughs> and we know where to find terrorontheTube.co.uk. And thanks a lot, Nick. Thanks very much. Yeah. And we'll do this yeah. again soon. Yeah. Okay, Mark. See you. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.